Paper one is the matrix. Matrix. Yeah. 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 Exactly. All right, so we should be just about good to go. I'm just going to leave this over here. So all you need to do is press pause as well, and we should be able to start in just a second. I might just call anyone else in. Oh, this start. Start. Sorry? Yeah, already cool. start. This is like how much do we have? Um, I found like on day one. A lot of people, show. lot of people showed up on day one. Day two has been a slightly less. Yeah. yeah. Just to make sure this doesn't die. If anything weird pops up on here, just give me a shout. I'll come down. Yeah. Cool. Right, let's go. There might be a few people who saw on lunch and then we'll come later. But oh, that's all good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mike should be on too. <laughs> All right, cool. So I think we might get started, guys. Um, so hello, I know a few of you. My name is Pravik, um, and we'll be talking about room and escape for this one, um, as well as a bit of endo stuff. So the bone stuff that wasn't in your um, uh, the lecture Tushar gave you on endo is going to be in this one. So that's what we're doing. Um, and hello to all the people live streaming in in their PJs. Um, I hope you are comfy. Cool. Uh, so we know this, this is the matrix. We've seen this a zillion times. Um, this is what we'll be covering. And um, you've all seen the mark breakdown by this point. I'm sure you've been bombarded with that. Room MSK will be, um, well, last year it was six marks in paper one. So it'll be something similar this time. And there's always one OSCE station on it as well. Um, so we'll go through like the different possibilities for that as well. Um, so how this is going to work. So we'll be talking about uh, monoarthritis, polyarthritis, and other inflammatory kind of stuff. Um, fractures and some anatomy stuff, uh, bone stuff, as I mentioned. So this is osteoporosis and other stuff, um, and then clinical stuff. And I use a lot of like acronyms, which you all should be like really familiar with by this point of the year. Uh, and we've got a bit of a code going because I know at this point of year we're all about the yield. So if we're saying SpongeBob, it's like really high yield. I think you should memorize it and you should know it off the top of your head. Um, if we're saying like Squidward, that it's like lower yield. If you're kind of a surface letter, you can kind of skip it and I'll never find out and it's all good. Um, and when you see Sandy, it's stuff that like might not necessarily be examinable, but like I think it's really useful to still know uh, because at some point, you know, you're going to be a doctor in an ED, in a clinic, whatever, and you're going to probably see this and it's still good to know. Um, so hopefully, so SpongeBob and Sandy, that's where we're at. Um, two things you should know. And can we all, can you guys hear me well? Yeah. Okay, good. Cool, and credit, so obviously we have Prof Leach, I'm a big fan of, also Prof Varand, um, head of SES, who some of 
if you're at your NMC, Danny Casey, you might be familiar with. Um, so a lot of good like rheumatology academics um, and some other students as well um, whose lectures I've looked at. Now we're going to start this in Italy. So Tower of Pisa. So this is like the basic like, principles of rheumatology in terms of classifying joint disease. Um, so there's four things we look at. We look at is it polyarticular or monoarticular. Um, we look at whether it's inflammatory or non-inflammatory, which is a really big one. And we'll talk about like how you can differentiate between those two things. Uh, we talk about if it's like roughly symmetrical, if it's uh, looking asymmetrical. And then of course, acute versus chronic. And in rheumatology, like chronic is more than six weeks. Um, so any kind of joint disease slash problem, we should in our head be like classify it in this kind of, um, in this kind of structure. Uh, and you can like, if you're really logical and nerdy, you can like classify, classify all the ones under that. Um, inflammatory versus mechanical. So this is like really high yield. I'm sure you all kind of know this by now. So inflammatory is if you have um, stiffness after immobility, which includes sleep, which is just like immobility for like eight hours, if you think about it. Um, and in inflammatory, this is significant. So this is more than 30 minutes. Often it's even more than that, like it's more than an hour, but 30 minutes is usually what we use as like the benchmark. Uh, the reason for this is like, it's basically just all the proteins in the fluid. Um, they just kind of all link together and like it gets really stiff because of that. Um, versus in non-inflammatory, where, where the, what we call early morning stiffness, important to note we're talking about joints, um, is less than 30 minutes. It's not significant. Um, and when is the stiffness worse? So in inflammatory, as we said, because you get this protein um, linking together, um, you, it's worse in the morning and worse after rest. And this is also called the gel phenomenon. Um, whereas in non-inflammatory, it's worse uh, when you've used it because of that you know, uh, wear and tear that you get. Um, so obviously, inflammatory features, warm thread and swelling, we'll see in inflammatory, not really in non-inflammatory, although you can get bony swellings in osteoarthritis, which is a different kind of swelling. It's not like tissue swelling. Um, the other thing is effusion and bogginess. So this is a couple of things which um, a lot of people get really confused about because they think it's the same thing and it's not. So effusion is like a really non-specific kind of sign. It just shows you that there's more fluid um, in the synovial space. And this can be because of an inflammatory reason or a non-inflammatory reason. So it doesn't differentiate. It just tells us something in the joints going wrong. Um, versus bogginess, which we only see in inflammatory. And the reason for that, we'll, we'll pass that. We'll, we'll get back to that. Um, and then other stuff. So obviously inflammatory markers will be up in inflammatory, not in non-inflammatory. Um, the other thing we should know by this point in the year. So if a test is specific, it's good for ruling something in. If a test is sensitive, it's good for ruling something out. And this is something that crops up again and again in rheumatology um, in terms of the tests we order. So we'll talk about that, um, but it's important to know that. Um, taking a room history, so it's, it's just like taking any other history, but the symptoms you wanna ask about, so you wanna ask about stiffness and pain in particular, um, but also other inflammatory features. Is it red, is it heat, is it swelling, you know, all, all the normal stuff. Your WWQQAA, which by now we should be able to nail, but um, remember at the end of the day, we're looking for that PISA classification. Where does it fall under that? And all these questions you're asking is for that reason, is to put it in that categorization, um, particularly to find out if it's inflammatory or non-inflammatory, which is a really like, fundamental thing. Um, and then in the past history and stuff, you can like hunt around and suss out for other stuff, other autoimmune stuff um, and other family history and things, as you guys would know. Um, and then taking kind of an aside from rheumatology and talking more generally about pain. So I think this is really poorly kind of understood such poorly taught um, in medical school, but I think it's an important thing to know in real life in that there's two basic kinds of pain. There's nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. Um, and of course there's like psychological pain as well, which is a whole other thing, we won't go there. Um, nociceptive pain is when you get your nociceptors getting activated. So this is nerves that are like designed to sense pain, getting activated and telling your body, hey, we're in pain, you know, because of physical or chemical uh, stimuli. And it's often, quite like vague and non-specific uh, versus neuropathic pain, which is the nerves themselves, something is going wrong with them. So either usually they're getting compressed, um, they're getting ischemic, there's an infection, you know, there's something wrong with the actual nerve. It's not the nerve, it's not like the standard thing it was designed to do, it's something actually wrong with the nerve. And that's when we find like patients give, I don't, you've been on the wards, you, like patients give really specific descriptions, like really vivid, um, it's burning, it's electric, it's shooting, it's like straight out of a comic book. Um, and this is often means that it's neuropathic. Um, in terms of how we manage the two, so it, it, on one hand, it's quite simple, managing any pain, which by now you should have some idea of like the WHO pyramid of how to manage pain. Um, we start with the simple stuff of paracetamol and NSAIDs, 
um, then you might consider going to weak opioids. And if you want to know which opioids are weak or strong, I would remember codeine and tramadol, the two weak ones. Everything else is pretty much a strong opioid. Um, versus a neuropathic pain where you also do that, but um, there's medications which for some reason, which we don't understand slash I don't really understand, um, work more effectively in them. And they're your tricyclic, so things like amitriptyline, um, your SNRIs, um, such as clonidine, and your gabapentins. So you might have seen patients on the wards with these things. Uh, but anyway, that's kind of an, a, a practical kind of aside. Um, so we'll jump straight into the monoarthritis before we do. So anatomy of a joint. So we know this, this is really basic. This is a synovial joint. We have the synovial fluid. We have the articular cartilage and obviously we have the two bones. Um, now we also have a synovial membrane, which is also called the synovium. Now over to you. Does anyone know how thick um, in terms of how many cells a normal synovium should be? Yeah, exactly. One to two cells. Um, and that's normal. However, when we get uh, synovitis, when we get inflammatory arthritis, uh, what happens is because of the inflammation, um, the synovium just goes crazy. It hypertrophies, hyperplasia, like it thickens like crazy. And it ends up being like thousands of cells thick. And this is the bogginess you feel when you're doing your room exam. You're literally feeling all these cells. And that's why it feels like gel-like if you felt it on the wards versus uh, effusion, which is just like fluid. So that's a really important distinction. Um, osteoarthritis, which is a chronic thing. It starts off usually as a monoarthritis but the natural history of it will be that it turns into a polyarthritis. Um, and like the dumb explanation of why it happens is wear and tear and, and like you can use this, it's a good explanation. In terms of what actually happens, it's um, like water being increased, water content being increased in your, um, uh, in your what do you call it, uh, the cartilage. Um, and this activates the nociceptors and that's where you get pain. Um, and it can also be a secondary thing. So if you've had uh, RA for a long, rheumatoid arthritis for a long time, if you've had gout for a long time and it's out of control, then you can basically end up getting osteoarthritis. Um, and also in septic arthritis. So if you've had a really bad episode of septic arthritis, which wasn't treated, it can basically just erode your whole joint and you end up with this um, and worse things in septic. But we'll get there. Um, risk factors. So this is like fairly kind of standard stuff which you can go through. Um, importantly, the joint pain is, as we discussed, it's a non-inflammatory pattern. So it's worse with activity and worse with weight bearing as well, particularly when you're looking at things like knees and joints, um, and it's better with rest. Um, examination findings, this is where I think the real money is at in terms of you, you really got to know this, you got to be able to reel this off your head. So we're looking for bony swellings, for uh, Bouchard's and Hebidone's nose at the proximal and uh, distal interphalangeal joints respectively. We're looking for squaring of the thumb. So we can see some of these things in this picture up here. Uh, and then you also look for crepitus, see if you can feel that, um, slash in rare cases hear that. But um, because it's not a systemic thing, obviously we don't have rashes and other kind of systemic features um, in osteoarthritis. Now on an X-ray, we have this mnemonic called loss because we have a loss of joint space. Um, and it's usually asymmetrical because it's not a systemic thing, yeah. Um, we can get osteophytes, which can occur at any point throughout the disease. It's not necessarily showing severity, like it can happen very early on as well. And then you have subchondral sclerosis and subchondral cysts, which apparently some people can see properly in an x-ray, but I cannot. But that's all right. Um, and then how we manage osteoarthritis. So this is, uh, this is kind of your bread and butter, and you should have some kind of approach to this. Um, so you start off with the simple stuff, what we call SNAP, you know, um, uh, weight loss, um, nutrition, exercise, uh, alcohol, smoking, you know, cut all that down. So that's all the standard stuff, but in particular weight loss because obesity is a risk factor. Um, you want to send them to the physio, see how they can help, what they can do. Um, and if, if it's like a lower limb thing, then you can think about walking aids as well and like orthotics. Uh, medication, so this is just like standard nociceptive pain, right? So we can give you simple analgesics, paracetamol NSAIDs, um, and then if it's like a focal thing and it's ongoing, you can also give um, injected steroids. Um, and then you can also do surgery as well, um, which if it's like really bad and really troublesome, you can think about doing that. Um, the other big one, so crystal arthritis, also known as gout, um, but there's also pseudo gout as well, which we'll talk about. So this is an acute inflammatory. It's usually a monoarthritis, occasionally a polyarthritis, and very rarely, a, sorry, occasionally an oligoarthritis, and very, very rarely a polyarthritis. Um, and this happens mostly in your distal joints because the crystals, um, they crystallize when it's cold. 
okay? And it's called in your periphery. So that's why you get that. You get that in your hands, you get that on your feet. You know, typically, classically, EMQ buzzword is your first metatarsophalangeal joint. Um, but you can also get hands, and you can also get, if, if there's been a chronic kind of thing, you can get um, gouty tofi in your ears as well. Um, now, as I mentioned, there's two types. There's gout and pseudo gout. So gout where has monosodium urate in the joints, whereas pseudo gout has calcium pyrophosphate. Um, and this kind of has two, if you think it's like, you know, pouring water into a bathtub and the bathtub's overflowing. Either there's not enough water going out or you're pouring too much in. Um, usually it's because there's not enough water going out. Um, so it's, un, it's an under excretion problem generally. Um, the risk factors for gout, this is where I think the money's out for gout because I don't know if you've seen patients with this condition, but it's like a very typical kind of demographic which comes up all the time in real life, in EMQs and everything. Um, so this is what you should know. So older males who might be a little bit obese, might have kidney problems, might be using diuretics, which are like drying them out and causing the um, crystals to be in higher concentrations. And this thing we call a high purine diet. So um, this, is, uh, this is, purines are found in alcohol and meat in seafood, particularly in shellfish. I don't know if that's an EMQ thing, or, but that just comes up all the time. Um, so those are our kind of main risk factors. And as I mentioned, like the, the typical presentation is like someone with a severe pain in the big toe, um, and it's an inflammatory pattern. And a real life point, which is um, a good question even to ask and ask you, to be honest, is like people complain that, oh, you know, it hurts even um, when I'm lying in bed and like when I'm, the, the sheets are touching my toes kind of thing. Um, that's a very typical complaint. And we've touched on gouty tofa. It's important to note that this is a mark of chronicity. If someone's coming in with gout for the first time, they probably won't have it. But if they've had it repeatedly, then they do have it. And importantly, this is a condition where like, if you don't treat it, then it's going to get worse each time. Each like, flare is going to be worse and worse. Um, and we need to differentiate it from septic arthritis. Um, so what we would do, so you do a joint aspirate with uh, analysis. And in gout, there'll be negatively birefringent needle shape, buzzword, buzzword. In pseudo gout, it'll be positively birefringent rhomboid shape. Um, if you're really nerdy, there's a the pictures there for you. Um, serum uric acid. So you would think, like this is a bit confusing, but it usually only rises after maybe a couple of weeks. Um, and when you test it acutely, it might be normal. It might even be low because the uric acid is in the joints, right? It's not necessarily in the blood. Um, so this is not really that useful of a test acutely, but you'd still do it, slash say it in an OSCE. Um, and if you do an x-ray, you'll see some erosions, uh, but that's not too big of a deal. In terms of how you manage it, so obviously you want to decrease that high purine diet and you want weight loss as well. So this is just coming back to the risk factors um, acutely. So this is, this is important to know the order because this, is, this comes up all the time. Um, first, you start off with NSAIDs. Uh, then you would do colchicine and typical side effect for this is diarrhea. Um, and only then you would do PRED after that if those haven't worked. That's, that's like the stepwise management um, for acute. Now, chronic. So you wouldn't start anyone, like if someone, if I come in and I've had one episode of gout, you wouldn't necessarily start me on chronic. This is only if someone has repeated episodes and it's kind of out of control. The first one you go for is allopurinol, uh, which uh, people often have like an allergic reaction to. That's important to know. And this decreases the production of uric acid. Um, and then the second line, which to be honest is hardly used because you know you don't want to get kidney stones, is probenicid, which increases the excretion, which is if you think about it, which is why you get the kidney stones. Um, but you can get kidney stones in gout anyway, uh, and it, it'll be obviously uric acid kidney stones because this is what's there. Um, and as I mentioned, like it'll just get worse if you don't treat it. Septic arthritis. So this is obviously the big red flag for. Um, a monoarthritis, which you always, always, always need to rule out. Um, it's usually a bacterial thing, particularly Staph aureus. Um, it can be from an injury, so you need to ask this, you know, have you had any trauma to your joint? Um, or it can be like bacteria, it can be from the blood itself. Um, if there's more systemic things going on, they're a drug, IV drug user, or they're immunocompromised. Um, and basically, if they have any underlying joint disease, then they're more at risk of septic arthritis. Um, so they'll come in with a really, really severely painful, red, inflamed, swollen knee. Oh, typically it's knee, but it can be any joint. Um, and it's worse with movement because if you think about it, you're moving your joints, you're like just aggravating things further. So you can ask that on history as well. Um, blood test, as you'd expect, you know, it's an infection, so it's all the stuff you'd expect. If you do an aspirate, then obviously you're going to see like stacks of white cells because they're all trying to get in there. But importantly, this is like, it's kind of like a pocket compartment that the body struggles to get into. Um, which is why it's so bad if you don't uh, treat it, because if you don't treat it, like 
the body's going to try and get in there, but it struggles and then really bad stuff happens. The joint gets eroded and, and like, it's just a nightmare. And like, it can be fatal as well if you don't treat it. How you treat it? So you, because it's staph, so you're going to give flu clocks. Um, you might consider VANC if it's resistant. Usually it's IV uh, for a couple of weeks and then you, you can do oral for a couple of weeks. And if it's like getting really bad and eroded, then that's when you can do a joint washout as well. Um, and as I said, so like this can literally kill them. So it's important we recognize it really early. So osteomyelitis, so this is kind of a similar thing. This is an infection of um, usually of the long bones, usually at the metaphysis of the long bones. Um, and this can be, again, because of like a local thing, they've had trauma or, uh, or even surgery, um, or typically like they're also diabetic and they, have, they get feet ulcers. So if you're diabetic, you're already immunocompromised. And if you're getting an ulcer on your feet, then like that's just a, an invitation for the bacteria, um, or it can be from sepsis from the blood. Um, so we have a bone lesion, which is like painful and inflamed. And importantly to differentiate from septic arthritis, if they move around the joint, like it's, there's not that much of a change because this is the bone itself. Um, there's something they do in real life sometimes called a probe to bone. Um, I've never seen this, but apparently they do this sometimes where like you insert something, obviously sterile, you insert like a little rod thing into the diabetic foot ulcer and see, can you hear like a hit? I don't know, man, but apparently they do this. And if you can hear the hit, that means it's gone all the way to the bone. Um, so that's really bad. And you would investigate slash manage this in the way you would expect. So it's, it's very similar to septic arthritis. Um, and obviously you don't want it to get so bad that you have to amputate. Um, and the other thing is um, because bone, like chunks of bone can literally just come off and it act, essentially acts like a foreign body, which is a sequestrium and your, your body doesn't like that and will try to fight that. So that can also happen. Finally, in monoarthritis, you can also get a hemarthritis. Usually this is like, if you read this in an MQ, they're gonna have a lot of risk factors for this. Um, they've had some sort of trauma, they're on blood thinners, they have hemophilia typically. Um, and if you do a joint aspirate, obviously you see stacks of blood cells. Um, this is, you just do supportive management because your body absorbs all this stuff. Obviously you don't give NSAIDs because Cox one, like it's antiplatelet, so you don't want to make it worse. So you don't do that. All right, so putting all that together. So monoarthritis, this is your approach, or this is at least my approach for monoarthritis. First, you want to start out by ruling septic arthritis. Um, ask them about trauma for sure. Then you want to suss out, is there gout going on? Because that's also often just as painful and just as like severe. Um, and then you want to think about other stuff like OA um, or hemarthritis. So that's your approach for monoarthritis. This could easily be an OSCE. This is obviously going to be in Qs as well. Um, so let's see what we think about this. Cool. Yeah, so that's where we're going with it. Septic arthritis, exactly. So we can, it's kind of a bit of a giveaway. So they've done the, they've done the, the they can tell you there's no uric acids there. So it's probably, it's not gout. Um, and it seems really severe and they're immunosuppressed. They've been on steroids for yonks. So it's, uh, yeah, so it's, this is, this is septic arthritis, exactly. So yeah, sim I mean, <laughs> this is really obvious, I think, because there's all the buzzwords. So he's on diuretics, risk factor for gout. He's had a sudden acute painful knee. Um, he's not febrile, which is okay, but you know, red swollen. Um, and obviously there's those crystals in that pattern that we talked about. So it's obviously gout there. It'll get harder, don't worry. Okay, so this is just testing if you remember like the stepwise management of gout. So it's gout because it's a first metatarsophalandral joint. Um, he's had this before, like it's gout, we're happy with that. Um, what is the best first line therapy? So if you think about like the stepwise management, the first thing is NSAIDs, yeah. Um, like you, you can think about paracetamol, but honestly, it's not the best. So the best answer would be naproxen, which is an NSAID. Um, and Pred, you start is your third line. Um, steroids, yeah, not really. Allopurinol is a chronic thing, not for acute gout. Yeah. 
Is it hemochromatosis? It might be. Well, let's have a look. So he's had a recent episode of gout. So we know that there's been recent inflammation going on. And then the important thing, and this happens in real life all the time, like we measure iron levels, particularly people coming into hospital, they're sick already, they might have an infection. Um, and often we find it's elevated. So this doesn't mean they have hemochromatosis because in hemochromatosis, normally like the numbers are up in the thousand, thousands and you have like symptoms, right? You have like a polyarthritis, you have heart problems, diabetes, like you have all sorts of other issues. So this is more an acute inflammatory picture. So the answer was A. Um, so these are, we should know our acute phase reactants. Um, so this is like CRP, haptoglobin fibrinogen, but obviously ferritin as well, which we mentioned, which is in the picture, um, versus albumin and transferrin, which actually go down um, with inflammation. And it's important to note, like, because you would have learned CRP and SR are inflammatory markers, which they both are, but CRP is more an acute, Thing. It goes up really early, as you can see in this graph, whereas ESR is more for chronic, often autoimmune stuff, stuff that has been happening for like days to weeks is when your ESR would go up. So that's a really important learning point for EMQs and for real life. Cool. So any queries, questions on monoarthritis before we jump into the good stuff? No. Okay. So polyarthritis. So this is where, this is where a lot of stuff happens. So just to get this out of the way, this is more a real life thing, not really an exam thing, but viral arthritis is, is a very common thing that happens. It's, you just get an acute polyarthritis after a viral infection. If you ever had the, like the flu and things like this, then you might know what I'm talking about. It's self-resolving. We don't really worry about it. However, it can indicate like a seroconversion. They might have just recently got HIV, hep ABC. So you just want to keep an eye out for that. Um, but it, it's usually nothing major. Connective tissue disorders. So now we're really jumping into the heat of rheumatology. Um, a few things. So you might have seen on the wards, there's this thing called an ENA, extractable nuclear antigens. This is like a panel of different uh, blood tests, um, including for these diseases, um, as well as anti-Smith. Uh, you don't need to memorize what's in it, but you can just, in an OSCE, if they ask you for investigations, you can just throw this out there. Um, but I'd also list all the specific things you're looking for, to be honest. Um, the other thing, which, some, which is like, it can be an EMQ question for mixed connective tissue disease, which obviously has features of all sorts of connective tissue diseases. This is the antibody which um, would be raised in that. That's just, you know, just know that one. And the other thing, Raynaud's. So Raynaud's is when you get vasospasm in your digits. Uh, and there's like this triphasic change. So it, start, it goes white all of a sudden, then goes blue, then goes red when the blood flow suddenly comes back. Um, it can be primary, which happens in a lot of... Um, typically like young white females, but also in me for some weird reason, or it can be secondary. <laughs> Seriously, I get this, it's so bad. Um, or it can be secondary, which is in connective tissue diseases. And it's induced by cold and vibration, so I hate cold weather for that reason. Um, and we give um, your, your amlodipine and stuff like that um, on nifedipine tech, uh, commonly for that. So your calcium channel blockers, peripheral ones. Uh, and you can obviously get ischemia for that, and that can be severe. Hereditary, so like um, th this is not too important, but like Ellos, Danlos, so this is when you have like collagen abnormalities. Um, there's a lot of different types. Most of them, there's normal life expectancy. If you have the vascular form, then you can get aortic dissection, you can get pneumothoraces, um, and it's not a good time. But otherwise, it, you just get like joint and skin hypermobility, you know, fun party tricks. I have a friend who has this condition. Um, the other one, which Monash, for some weird obsessive reason, absolutely loves, even though it's Incredibly rare, like Troy Savan has it, but like it's incredibly rare. I've never seen anyone with this. Um, yeah, he does. And this is where you get, this is where you get um, abnormal fib fibrillin, if I can pronounce it. And it's a connective tissue thing. It's autosomal dominant. Um, you get, you know, tall, thin basketball. It's that whole thing. But also taught like long digits, which you can kind of appreciate here, but not really. Um, scoliosis, high arc palate. Like we all know this from the cardio exam. Complications, two big ones, aortic dissection, but also um, spontaneous pneumothoraces for which we can't do too much. So that's a scary one. RA, okay. So this is a chronic inflammatory polyarthritis, uh, and this is where you get B and T cells in your joint. Um, you also get this thing called a panis, which is like nerdy pathology stuff. It's just granulation tissue. Um, this typically happens, so like most connective tissue disorders, to be honest, like the demographic is usually young white females, um, but also if you have a family history or if you're a smoker as well, uh, about 1% of the population. So um, the, where the money's at, again, the examination findings. Um, so this is where you get a symmetrical arthritis. It's often sparing the distal interphalangeal joints. 
um, and it's not passively correctable. Like you can't move it and correct it. Uh, and Swan Neck, Brutonia Z, um, Ulna Deviation, Vola Subluxation, Rubitonia, Nodules. Just memorize this list, like have, be, be, know what those are, but like be able to reel that off in, in an exam. You can get extra articular features, but the important learning point is you don't get a rash in RA. Uh, and on X-ray, the mnemonic is less, so you also get loss of joint space, but because it's systemic, it's symmetrical, you get erosions, and this is a big thing in connective tissue diseases. Um, you can see a soft bone if there's like osteopenia, you can see soft tissue swellings. Um, your antibodies, now the sensitive one is RF, um, rheumatoid factor, uh, which about, I think, like 10% of the population or something is positive for this. So like some of us would be as well. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. Uh, versus anti-CCP, which is specific. So this is the one you're doing to rule in. Um, the real life point is actually in like one in five cases, people with RA, both of these can be negative as well, which is bizarre. You won't get that in MQ, but you should know that for real life. What we do out of this, um, in order, something's come up here. So I don't know what that is. So you might want to have a look just to make sure that's um, going. But anyway, um, so obviously smoking is a risk factor. We want to cut that down. Um, you can start your anti-inflammatories, NSAIDs, PRED, um, DMARDs. And the important thing to know with DMARDs uh, is they are, most of them are hepatotoxic. Um, the big one is methotrexate. Michelle is his favorite drug. We should know this very well. Um, it's a dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor. So we give it with folic acid as well because we don't want people getting folate deficient and we don't want macrostatic anemias. We're not about that. It's also teratogenic. So we don't want people getting pregnant on this as well because it will cause your tube defects. So that's important to know. Um, and there's other ones there and you can see there's some side effects and stuff. It's not too important to know. Um, the complications, so you can get serositis, so you can get uh, pericardial effusions as well as uh, pleural effusions. You can get heart disease, um, you can get osteoporosis, cytopenias, and scleritis at the eye. Um, and these are all terrible, terrible things. So this is, a, this, is like, this is a very serious kind of illness. And because of that, like the lifespan is 10 years shorter, mostly because of the heart disease. Uh, you can also get nodules, um, typically and buzzwordily on your lung. Uh, and you can you're at an increased risk of carpal tunnel as well. Cool. Hang on. Yeah, cool. Uh, Lupus, lupus, lupus. Okay, so this is the this is a really scary one. So this is type three hypersensitivity. So we should know like the four hypersensitivities. You know A, B, C, D. Um, you know allergic antibodies, uh, immune complexes, and then delayed with, with the T cells. This is one way you can remember it. Um, this is an inflammatory polyarthritis. It's a really like sinister, weird kind of disease. You don't see the erosions that you typically would on an X-ray. You can only see them on an MRI, so they're really subtle. Um, again, typically it's in young females, but uh, in young Asian females in particular. Um, much like RA, you can get an arthritis that is distal uh, into phalangeal joint sparing. Uh, the important difference is that the deformities are often passively correctable. You can take the patient's hand and move them um, and fix them. And this is called, yeah, and there's a word for this sometimes called jacuzzi arthropathy, which looks very similar to the RA hand. Um, the, like, the features for RA, except you can passively correct it. So that's usually yes and although sometimes it can be other things. Um, you get your typical, as you know, your butterfly or ma uh, malar rash, which spares in nasolabial folds. Um, you can also get other rashes, so like that discoid rash on your back, often a photosensitive rash as well. Um, and then you can get scarring alopecia, mouth ulcers, renals, it's very systemic illness. Um, when you're investigating, so you do you know, you check out most things, you check out the blood, you check out the kidneys, you check out inflammation. C3 and C4, that's commonly done because that's often reduced, which is fairly specific for lupus, so know that one. And your two antibodies, your ANA, which is sensitive, again, like some of us would be positive for that. Um, and your anti-double-strand DNA, um, which is specific. I think I should explain both of these because it's confusing. So your ANA is measured in like titers, which is like when they take a sample of your blood, and they dilute it by a factor of like one to X and like they keep, they keep doing that and seeing, is it still positive? Can I still detect the antibody? Then they keep diluting it. So if it's positive, even though they've diluted it so much, then obviously it's, it's really like high concentrations. So that's quite serious. Um, and that's when it would be positive. And they also do like dye staining and all this funky stuff. Um, and antihistone antibodies are like more specific for lupus. And with your anti-double-stranded DNA, unlike all your other room, uh, investigations, 
this comes with a number. So you can actually, which correlates roughly to the severity. Uh, to the severity. So you can, that's really important to know as well. And anti-Smith is another one that's specific, but less commonly done. How we manage this, so obviously we said smoking is bad for this, so we want them to cut down on the smokes. Um, we want basic skincare, sunscreen, um, oral hygiene for the mouth ulcers. Um, you normally start with NSAIDs, then you can go to hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine, and then you add PRED, which we don't, you know, PRED has a lot of long-term side effects, which we'll get to that. Um, and you can also do methotrexate as well. Complications, so at some level, it overlaps a lot with RA. You get all these same things. Um, but you can also get lupus nephritis, so, um, which is usually partly nephrotic, partly nephritic. It can be nephrotic, can be nephritic, can be both, whatever. Um, there's like six different classes. We don't need to know too much about it other than that it exists. Um, and that under the microscope, you see wild glomeruli, buzzword, buzzword. Um, you also can get you know, endocarditis, as you know, is usually infective. But because lupus is really weird, it, you can just get purely like autoimmune endocarditis, which is Goodman Sachs. And you can also get neuroscience complications if it's really, really bad. Uh, some syndromes we should know about that it's associated with. So Sjogren's, which um, RA can also be associated with, which we'll go through in more detail. And the other big one is antiphospholipid syndrome, um, where we have uh, hypercoagulability. So we have DVTs, PEs, um, miscarriages, headaches. It's, it's, it's pretty bad. And there's three antibodies you need to know for that. And, these, and here they are. Um, and for, if you have this illness, then you'll need like anticoagulation long term. This is getting squidwitty, but if you want to like compare the two, you can do that. Um, scleroderma, okay, this is the other major connective tissue disorder. So this is where you have um, increased collagen, and so you get skin sclerosis. Um, and because of this, it's also sometimes called systemic sclerosis. If you're really old and fancy, then that's another word. Um, there's two types. There's limited or more fear, where it affects the skin below the knees and elbows, plus or minus the face, but no more than that versus diffuse where it's, it affects more of your skin and usually it's more systemic as well. And this actually decreases your lifespan. Um, it's important, like that, th those are the two definitions. There's like old definitions flying around saying like Crest, Uronisi, and Limited, and that's kind of, we've moved on from that. And this is the new definition, so I, I would follow this. Um, and what you're looking for, so as I mentioned, Crest, know this mnemonic, Known off by heart. So calcinosis, Raynaud's disease, and note that it's disease because it's secondary rather than primary. Um, esophageal dysmotility, um, sclerodactility, and uh, telangiectasia, which is typically on the face. Um, and obviously we get the, the uh, I don't know if I should call it a rash, but that skin discoloration and thickening. Um, and big like feces, that's no false word, but that sometimes comes up. Um, on investigation, we're looking for ANA with a centromere staining pattern. Um, for the limited type, it's usually anti-centromere. Anti for the diffuse, um, it's one of these two. Uh, and how we treat it, it's just skin stuff and steroids. There's not too much we can do about it. Um, complications, so you can get ulcers, you have hypothyroidism. You can get renal problems where your um, lenin goes through the roof and you can treat this with capital. You don't really need to know that. What you do need to know is what happens at the lungs because in the limited form, you get pulmonary hypertension, um, just kind of idiopathically almost versus in diffuse where you get that, but it's, there's also pulmonary fibrosis going on. So there's kind of more of a reason for that. Sjogren, so we've touched on this. This is when you get lymphocytes in your lacrimal and salival, salivary glands, typically in females who have RA or SLE, and they'll complain of dry eyes, dry mouth, and sometimes enlarged painful parotids. Um, there's something called the Schirmer's test, which uh, will be positive as well. And the antibodies for this are anti rho and anti la. But again, the real life practical point is people are often negative for them, which is a little bit sneaky, but it's worth knowing. And 5% of these patients have lymphoma as well. So just watch out for that. Uh, if you like, this creeps me out, this picture, but if this is how you learn, this is there for you. Um, inflammatory myopathies. Okay. So in these, you get a proximal bilateral muscle weakness. Um, your CK is really high because your muscle is pretty much breaking down. And the way we diagnose this is through a muscle biopsy. And if it's really bad, you can get rhabdomyolysis as well. Um, the two ones you should know, so polymyositis, which is CD8 mediated, um, which is, has anti jo one antibodies, and you can sometimes get interstitial lung disease with that, versus dermatomyositis, where it's CD4 and CD8. Um, and you get like these really buzzwordy things. So you get Gottron's papules, which are these ones here. Um, you can get a shawl or v-neck sign, which is often photosensitive. And then you can get a heliotrope rash, which is periorbital. Um, 
K um, and edema. And the antibody for this is anti mu 2 And importantly, a lot of these patients have solid organ malignancy, so you want to like do full on CT scans of the whole body and like make sure there's nothing going on. Okay, spondyloarthritis, and the way you can remember there's four main ones is pair, also called if you're really fancy, seronegative spondyloarthropathy. <laughs> Um, and it's usually asymmetrical. It's usually sacroiliac or lower limb, and it's usually an oligoarthropathy. And sometimes you can get what we call emphysitis. So this is like inflammation of where the tendons and ligaments insert into the bone, usually at the ankles and things like this. And uveitis, okay, versus scleritis, which we talked about before, which is actually a different thing. Um, and the famous thing is like HLA B27 may be positive, although not, not necessarily. Um, so let's go through them. So we have psoriatic arthritis, which HLA-B27 is positive in a third of them, where you get obviously a...